things that happen in our family that I wish never happened, but unfortunately, just the way that humanity is to this day still, um, war kills people. Sure. And uh, there is um, this this process of just not being able to kind of um, wrap your brain around why it happens to specific people and it happens to others. So as a child, I always wondered, like, why did I fall into that life yeah. at a specific age? And why am I able to do the things I, I can do now? toast from i have oh costco it's no. those buns I, I i don't even know the names of them but they look like a triangle they're super okay. they're super popular everyone loves them <laughs> okay i know That's it's a, random yeah it's quite the multicultural yeah. breakfast you got hey you gotta you gotta do what you gotta do you gotta do what you gotta do well listen i am so excited that you're here thank you for having me man. this is uh you and i have crossed paths so many times over the last year um, and then just in the sporadic conversations that we'd have, I think we really hit it off and it was just like, this is a no brainer. Like, let's just talk. And, um, for those who only see the work you do on social, yeah, they might not have any clue who Alan is behind all of that. Yeah. Let's start there. <laughs> Get right into it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, the beauty of social media is that you can be yourself or you can put on a persona of who you are, or you can do something that kind of is in between. And so over the years, I've really struggled like most other creators to find out like, where do you sit in this entire universe that is online? Um, but I found that giving a little bit of my personal life and giving a little bit of more of my persona made the best combination for branding purposes. So I think the best answer to that is that it's me and a lot of my aspirations but it's also me and a lot of like my just in general interests mm. that is who I am online. And when did you start the whole content creation? Oh, years and years ago. Some people, somebody might look at your profile now and go, oh, this guy's probably, you know, overnight success or whatever. But yeah. a lot of people don't understand. It's a lot of time in the making. Oh, it's substantial. I mean, I think Instagram was probably a year or two years old when I first jumped on the platform. And that was kind of what kickstarted my entire social media kind of uh, movement. Um, so it, it would probably be more than about 11 or 12 years now that I've been doing wow. social media content. Yeah, full time. Full time. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, in the last, yeah, for sure, 10 years, yeah. full time now. Yeah. What were you doing before? I was in, uh, I was studying urban planning and urban design at University of Waterloo. So I finished my undergrad and then I started my master's degree in architecture at University of Toronto. Hmm. Yeah. So that was so, the route it, you were going. <laughs> <laughs> and then you decided, screw it. I'm yeah, going to create all, content. It, it all changed. <laughs> <laughs> it, all went, it all went, I wouldn't say downhill, but it, it definitely was an alternate, alternative universe that I was living in at the time. Were you always interested in this space, like photography, videography, or was that just something you, you just stumbled into? Um, I would say I was really interested in architecture, and I was really interested in design. And I, th I was trying to find another way to tell stories or to create art. And so this medium of photography fell into my lap and I was like, okay, this is the perfect way to be able to express my artistic imagination in, in other ways. Uh, and it wasn't as complicated as designing a building or designing spaces and structures right. that take a lot more time and demand a lot more work. So photography became this incredible outlet for me. Yeah. yeah. And so now as a content creator, um, there's a lot that goes into it. You're constantly having to create content. Is there, do you ever take a moment to, like, do you ever step back and go, this is a lot? Like, the expectation to consistently produce. And it's not just you creating content now for people who, you know, follow you on socials, but you're also working with tons of major brands. Like, mm -hmm. I've seen F1, I've seen others that you work with. You're not just creating for the folks who follow your page, but you're also creating for brands. And there's a certain level of pressure and expectation that comes with that. Absolutely. I think it's you have to take on a balanced approach for sure. Um, mitigating around various different brands is challenging because they all have their own different expectations. And many have guidelines for how they expect work to be kind of created. Um, so it is challenging. It is 
always challenging. It's always a, a learning experience. But I think the most important element that has helped me sustain myself throughout this process was having a strong brand, a brand identity where they know that what I come up with is the right answer. Mm. Um, there's no questions about my creative focus or my creative perspective. Um, I learned that the hard way because in the early stages, I was just kind of doing whatever I thought would work for brands. And eventually I sat back and I said, wait, are they working with me because of me or they just need someone to create some sort of content? And I want to separate myself from that motive of just creating for them. Right. I want to create a body of work that I'm proud of. Um, that would sit alone in the entire universe of content creators and something that they would be be able to reflect on and be like, okay, that was the reason why we worked with this guy because he is very unique in his perspectives and it shows. Yeah, so they're coming to you for you, yeah. not just for the sake of creating content because really and truly anybody can go and, and create nowadays, something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, now there's a lot more of it. Are you seeing, as a content creator, are you seeing... What are you seeing, actually? Let's start there. What are you seeing in the space today? Because it seems like with TikTok and instant virality, anybody can become a content creator. But there's still a separation between the ones who do this really well and the ones who are just hitting record and putting whatever out there. Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, there is a lot of change in the industry. Um, I'd say significant change in terms of new technologies being invested. Yeah. Uh, AI is a huge forefront runner for the future of, of what my job looks like and what many industries look like. Um, and other apps that have come along the way, like TikTok and all these, I, I call them filler apps because at the end of this, there's a huge turning point that's going to be happening. Just like olden days, like you had a person that was a photographer, they'd take your portrait, your family's portrait and everything and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. But that person didn't get on social media. So they missed an opportunity. Uh, but the people that got on social media, now they have to jump onto this next thing to get onto the next opportunity. So you what have is the to, next opportunity. It's it's very it's mainly related to AI technology and I would say digital sort of I don't know. Uh, it's it's something that is not I would say is much humanly human operated okay. or created through a, a person like myself, but more us delegating the tasks to some sort of technology to create the things that we want. Are you um, worried? I'm not worried because at the end of the day, this was never my plan in life. I didn't plan to be a photographer, content creator, filmmaker, whatever my title might right. be. Um, I, I've been... Uh, I've been always a, a, like a big supporter of just kind of going with the flow of things and seeing where it takes you. But being someone who is understanding and someone who can reflect on what the changes are and seeing a way that you can build on it. So in many ways, I've been doing my due diligence like any other artist to kind of create the pathway for myself in the future mm. uh, to see how those two things can intersect with what I'm currently doing. It's scary. I was, I'll tell you the truth. Sure. And maybe I don't like it. I, I'm not a big fan of... AI in many ways because I feel like is that's the furthest thing from our creativity now because it's separating us from what we can actually do with our hands and, and my, our own imagination because something else is making it a lot easier for us um, and that's a challenge but that is the reality of it so can't do much about it no yeah I mean <laughs> and, and AI is coming fast like it's, it's not only is it here but yeah. the tools are developing at a rapid pace it seems like every other day there's a new tool that you can that anyone can download and use AI to create anything absolutely I've seen stuff where people can literally go and create a faceless YouTube account and then blow it up and suddenly they've got you know six seven hundred thousand followers they're monetizing it and they don't have to ever show their face or their their persona, their creativity, they're using one app to do that. Like, it's just insane to me what's available. It's exciting, but it's also, you, it's insane how fast it's moving. And even I worry, I'm like, I don't know if I could even keep up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that is not in our hands because there's a whole nother universe of, of people who are focusing on it yeah. that are very different than you and I, when it comes to what we imagine to be day-to-day -day creativity. Um, a lot of people that are building out these platforms, building out the technology behind it, maybe don't really quite understand our world as much as we understand their world mm. or vice versa. Um, so I think that's the issue that I've had it with it is that it's growing at such a rapid pace, but is there dialogue between these two worlds to be able to still leave space for everyone? Yeah. Or is one thing just going to consume the other? And I think 
in this current moment, it's going to be something consuming the other. Just because of the path that technology has taken over the years, social media applications, creativity, all the entire industry of art has changed drastically over the years. We went from pattern makers or pattern makers, even textile designers doing things by hand to fabrication of ma- machines making everything. Yeah. Um, but yet we we also value when something is still made by hand. Yeah. Like we still put extra emphasis like, oh, this, did you see this? This was made by hand. It wasn't made by a machine. Totally. But the cost of it now is the question. Right. Now you got to pay more for it. Inflation is not our friend. (laughs) No, no, it's not. Especially nowadays. No, yeah. Inflation especially. Yeah. Um, Okay. So now I want to take a step back. You and I had a brief conversation at an event um, where we just started talking about, you know, men's health, mental health, and then you started talking about your backstory, which I thought was super interesting because it's not something that, you know, if I were to take a look at your socials, there's no traces of anything like that. Yeah. Can we talk about that backstory? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think going back to that conversation, it, it was probably an interesting turning point in your brain about who I was also. Absolutely. Because you were probably like, this kid is just rich <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> well, no, you know what? A lot of, uh, and the reason I said if they were to look at your, your social media yeah. is because there seems to be this narrative that, like if I pull up your profile and I see you traveling to this place and that place, recording this, yes. doing that, experiencing this and that, I go, wow, this guy lives an incredible lifestyle. You know, who wouldn't want that kind of a lifestyle? Mm-hmm. But again, it's to your point is that social media allows you to create a a very specific chapter of a story and you frame it how you want to frame it. And Control. as the receiver, I'm just receiving it however you present it. Yeah. So... As a podcast host, I'm going to dig in a little more and go, well, who is Alan yeah. behind all of that? So what's the backstory there? Yeah, I mean, so I think what you're specifically uh, getting to is the story of my childhood, mm-hmm. me coming to Canada and so on and so forth. So I didn't have the most, I would say, normal upbringing in, in a sense. I was born in Iraq. I was born in the northern part of Iraq in a small town called Ankawa. My dad was the mayor of the city for nine years. Um we had a very beautiful life there, but obviously through time and difficulties, there was war and a lot of different issues that would happen depending on your religious background or your ethnicity. I'm a Christian minority in the country. I speak Aramaic, which is a very old language in the Middle East and mm-hmm. in the world, endangered language. So we felt a little bit isolated living in Iraq at the time, but with the addition of war, it made it more difficult and challenging for us to live there. Um, so at one point, my family and I, we had to flee the country. Um, but before that, there was a lot of, I would say, things that happened in our family that I wish never happened. But unfortunately, just the way that humanity is to this day still, um, war kills people. Sure. And uh, there is um, this this process of just not being able to kind of um, wrap your brain around why it happens to specific people and it happens to others. So as a child, I always wondered, like, why did I fall into that life at a specific age? And why am I able to do the things I I can do now? And why should take advantage of them? So there's a lot of things in my brain that go on, on a daily basis, just kind of just trying to figure out the nuances of it. Yeah. But a lot of my family was murdered. Um, uh, my dad's entire, I'd say most of his family, so my grandparents, my dad's four sisters, his brother, his brother's wife, and the baby, all murdered. My dad was, at the time, fighting a war um, between Iran and Iraq, and my oldest uncle was also doing the same. So they never saw this happen. When they came back home, they realized that this had happened. And the reason it happened was because we lived in the part of Iraq where there was um, Kurdish minorities living, and at the time, Saddam Hussein didn't want Kurdish people in his country, so he would bomb them and he would attack them. And my uncle ran this retaliation, basically militia, against the Iraqi government, my youngest uncle. Um, and because he did that, the government found out and decided to take out his entire family. Hmm. My dad came back. My dad was put into prison for a long period of time. Um, my uncle took his children, his family, whatever was there, and just fled the country to Sweden. So for a very long period of time, we were just kind of like in this really weird space of trying to figure out where we, what we do. Like, we don't know if we should stay in the country, we should leave, but we can't. My dad's in prison. Right. Like, it's a very challenging kind of thing to wrap your brain around. And I was very young. My sisters were much older than me, so they could understand it a lot more. How old were you? At this time, I was five, six, uh, four or five years old. 
Um, but mind you, a four or five year old kid in the Middle East is very different very than different. a four or five year old child. And have to grow and, up very quickly. Yeah, you grow up very quickly, and you start to like really understand life a little bit faster. Um, so my dad got out of prison, and we decided to flee the country. Uh, we tried the first time; it was very challenging. We had to walk from Iraq to Turkey. Um, there was a moment where we would get like taken to the furthest point possible and then you're in the mountains for two and a half months basically just hiding away from the military hiding away from Turkish military whoever wow. catches you is sending you straight to prison or back mm-hmm. to your country um, in this process I think my family definitely hit a lot of enlightenment and understanding of life and the fact that like your survival is the most important and everything else in your life doesn't really matter as much it's just you trying to sustain life to live to be able to prosper and continue living um and we took that as we continued along this journey we got to turkey we lived in turkey for one year and we waited for united nations for our paperwork to go through decide on what country we we want to go to we were very fortunate enough to be given three options it was canada united states and australia we decided to go with canada so when we came to canada this is when my life kind of changed drastically because i came to canada realized wow none of the concerns that we had back home were here. Everything here made more sense. Uh, you could do whatever you wanted. There was this, this sense of freedom, but there was this also sense of like proudness of who you are. You can talk about your culture, your religion, like you can mm. relate to various types of people. And then you grow with that mentality as a child, you start to realize the biggest concerns in the world are not that big. I mean, for yourself, I mean, uh, obviously some people face very drastic problems in their life, but the things that I worried about day to day, small, little, minute things became very relevant. I started looking at the at the world as a, as a as like my my painting, I guess, uh, a canvas, canvas yeah. in a sense, where I could just decide to do whatever I want to do and however I want to do it. And I had the ob- ability to do this because Canada, in a, in a certain way, liberated my family and I. Um, and going back to mental health, the reason why this story kind of is is really tied to that is because when you as a man you grow up you start having certain expectations in life you go through hard times you're learning things and growing and going to school there's a lot of things men face a lot of challenges just like women do um and you have to navigate around those challenges so for me it was always this reflection of the possibility of life being completely something else and say i didn't get to come to canada yeah. Say we stayed as refugees and we were, you know, not able to have the life that we live nowadays. That second of a thought that crosses my mind automatically makes me go into this mode of like superpower mode. Like it's just like it just allows me to think of anything as not an obstacle anymore. Mm-hmm. And it just continues to allow me to like build on what I can do grow as a person, educate myself, and also around me, like really take care of the people that are in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, It empowers you. Empowers you in many ways, yeah. So it's hard to talk about a lot of these things, but in essence, I think it's just everyone's dealt different circumstances in life, and it depends on how you take those circumstances and what you can do with them that really can build you as a human um, and the way that you treat others around you, but ultimately the strength that you need to continue being prosperous um, and being prosperous doesn't mean financially it's 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 an all-around encompassing kind of factor in your life your mental health is super important you can be you can be super rich but have a weak mind and really reflect on things in the most negative light um, and I think building uh, building yourself in a way that is sustainable but also reflective on the worst possibilities of life makes you a lot more durable and um, able to combat the issues that come along the way. It definitely toughens the armor around you so yeah. that the small things that might annoy you or upset you in when you look at them in perspective or in, in relation to what you actually went through that meant something, you go, this is this is not that important. It's peanuts. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a good place to be in in the sense of it allows you to not get bogged down by the daily challenges that come with life. Yeah. Right. Like the, you know, you're late because of an Uber or, you know, the, your cell phone stop, whatever, like anything, like just stuff like that suddenly doesn't affect you as much anymore. And you're just more grounded. Yeah. Absolutely. Like my friends and I, we were on a plane recently coming back from San Francisco and mid flight, 
the plane turned around and went back to San Francisco. And they announced that uh, the co-pilot's electronics were just completely down for some reason. Oh, wow. Most people would just be like, some people actually got really angry. They were just like frustrated, like, oh, I can't believe this. I want to be home. And the guys that were with me looked at me and they said, wow, you like it didn't phase you at all. I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to sit and complain about? Like, first of all, I'm on a plane. That is yeah. amazing. That's super cool. I'm leaving San Francisco to go back to Toronto. Like what, like that's an incredible feat on its own. So I, and it's weird because I think when you have this, this reflective kind of personality built into you, it's not that you always go back to that thought of, oh, it could have been worse. It's not that. It's just you train your brain to not really care about those things too much. Mm. So the the issues that are, the small little minute things that come up through life, they're not problematic. They're just, they just become a, it's just a moment in time. Mm. You just got to experience it and go through it. That's it. So if someone listening to this, watching this, hears you speak this way and goes, you know what? I want to become like that. I want to develop this ability to not let the little things bother me is there something like a technique that you do is there something that you've learned along the way that you go this is something that someone can do i find there are times where i won't get phased by something and then there are times where the smallest of things just piss me off and i'm yeah. like oh like I, I can't believe i'm letting these small things get to me is there something you do that you can share that someone listening might be able to go okay i can try that i mean the one thing that i've learned along the years is that no one is programmed the same way our mm-hmm. brains all function very differently yeah. and i've i've watched so many of those um experimental type of uh, videos where they test people on various different things yeah. and see their answers everyone's very different that so it's hard to say one way to make something easier for someone else but i definitely think that empathy and humanity are the core of a person's personality um and in the sense that if you can be an empathetic person to others you can be empathetic to yourself and that is a reflection of you, what you see coming back to you and growing with that is super important because you start to care about yourself the same way you start to care about others and if you can care about yourself it means that you don't want a day that you're angry hmm. if you really care about yourself you know that having anger having frustration having stress are not good things for you so why allow yourself to have those feelings why allow yourself to dive do- deep into those negativities? I don't allow myself as often as I'd like to get into that mindset. I always try to be super positive, even when I know it's not the best way to be. Mm. But it's because I know by the end of the day, I'm not going to care about what I did yesterday. I can barely remember what I did two, three days ago, yet alone to be sitting in like a negative mindset about a certain thing that pissed me off because, it, I don't know, my taxi didn't show up or whatever it might be. My package is late four days. And I think that's incredible because the, it's, it's like the, the equivalent of, you know, if you were sitting in front of me right now and said, you know, Samir, I'm, I'm just having a a really shitty day because I made this mistake. And I go, well, you're an idiot. You shouldn't do that. I would never say that to you, Yeah. but we would say it to ourselves. Yeah, exactly. It's about like figuring out a way to not talk to yourself so negatively especially when you make a mistake because we're all prone to mistakes Mm -hmm. not letting yourself get so flustered and angry and like oh you're stupid you can't believe you made that mistake again type of thing that self-talk reinforces and i think that also starts to build this negative loop inside your brain like if i it's like conditioning yourself to think that you're stupid yeah yeah exactly and it's terrible no, you're supposed to be your defensive mechanism. <laughs> yeah. Like you're your biggest let, ally. <laughs> yeah, I would never speak to you that way. I would never let yeah. someone speak to you that way. So yeah. why do I speak to myself that way? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I, the most important thing for everyone to feel in their own skin is some sort of innocence about who they are. Yeah. And innocence is the, something that like you build it with children. You, the way you communicate with a child is there's innocence. So you, you don't want to hurt their feelings. You don't want to, you don't want them to feel certain things that, would provoke them Hmm. and similarly when you're talking to an adult or you're talking to yourself you have to think of yourself that way too you're an innocent person because at the end of the day do you wish bad on yourself do you wish bad on other people no and if you are then you're a damaged person and you need serious help but typically most of us have innocent mindsets where we're just trying to figure out things and some things are very challenging we don't know how to really wrap our brain around them that's where having a good sense of community good friendships 
having people to talk to is super important. A lot of men don't talk to other people. It's not because society deems us as macho and no, it's just because we actually don't know how to talk we don't have to other tools. people. Yeah. We've, we've been taught not to have those tools. Yeah. Um, or we think that we've been taught not to have those tools. But it's it's all, it's all it's interesting because I find that the most interesting conversations I've really had in my life have been with me and a bunch of guys just talking about life. But really talking about life, not yeah. the stupidness of yeah. things. And then you sit back and like, wow, well, that was really refreshing. And why was it refreshing? Because it doesn't happen often. Yeah. It's like a treat. If you can get your boys together <laughs> and one day talk about something serious yeah. without someone making a, a stupid remark, yeah. it's a real treat. Yeah. yeah. And you you suddenly feel a bigger sense of connection to that person. Like you finally get to know who that person is really and truly because mm-hmm. they don't have their their guard up. Yeah. You get to see who this, what they believe, how they feel about things. And, you, you know... Th- when you, <clears throat> I find that if there's scenarios where I'm having these kinds of conversations and I share, you know, like, you know, today's just not a good day for me. I woke up, I just was low energy. I'm not feeling really confident. Like, you know, there's days you wake yeah. up and you got your swagger. And then there's days you wake up and you're like, oh, I feel like shit. Yeah. I just can't do it. And then you tell that to someone and they go, you know what? I actually felt that way yesterday. And it's like, oh. Okay, well, what did you do about it? And then you just start talking, and suddenly you have this real connection with another human being, and you really feel like that judgment is gone. And I think for a lot of guys, particularly Middle Eastern guys, I mean, I can, like, just speaking from experience, yeah. there's a bit still of a cutoff in that sense of, like, you're not supposed to have these kinds of conversations. You're supposed to be, like, strong strong just go through it go through it deal with it yeah just man up like, sometimes i feel like that is the right answer too <laughs> and you know what i think like th- i think there's moments where you might have to put yourself together to deal with the situation in front yeah. of you and i think that's okay because there's times where i've had to deal with a situation where i'm like i can either let myself fall into the emotions that i know are brewing inside or i can try to resolve i can keep myself together and deal with the situation in front of me Mm -hmm. But as long as I still give myself the chance to resolve it later. Yeah. Right? Like, um, an example, last, not the Christmas that passed, the Christmas before that, my father went into the hospital and I was like, okay, I can either deal with the emotions of what's happening here or I can put that aside a moment, be there to support my mother, my sister, my father, my family. And then once that gets resolved, I can then allow myself the time to go and figure out what happened and go through the emotions and all that stuff. But I'm not just burying it, locking the door and And getting rid of the key. You know what I mean? Um, But one thing that you brought up that I want to ask you about is the term innocence. Mm -hmm. In war, innocence usually gets stripped away very quickly. Yeah. Did that happen to you? I wouldn't say to me because I was still young and I wouldn't be able to process that thought. But I think for my sisters, yes, definitely. Hmm. Um, when we came to Canada, I could, I, as they, as my siblings started growing up, I started really understanding what war did to them, um, especially being women uh, or children of war that were women. It's yeah. it's very very difficult. Um, not to say that men don't also experience the same thing, but I felt like with them, your 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 father or your mother is like everything. They're your security blanket. But men in the Middle East are taught to be very strong. Mm. You ever see a, a, a kid in the Middle East on TV? They have, they're very strong. <laughs> they're very they're strong. opinionated. They're opinionated. <laughs> they're strong. They're courageous. But the women still have this fragility to them, which is something that is just a part of the culture, essentially. Mm. So I feel like as an, as an, as a effect or, uh, on their innocence it was more substantial than it could have been on me at the time and i'm sure they probably hid so many things away from me for so so i wouldn't see yeah substantially yeah for sure have you ever had these conversations with them yeah we did um when we when it was interesting because many years ago my sister and i we sat down with my dad and we recorded him talking about everything that happened and it was extremely eye-opening i so many things i had never even knew that we had experienced like Things that I, I can't even talk about because they're just so, they're just so big. Yeah. Um, but there was a moment, like I can talk to you about one specific thing, but when we got to a certain part in Turkey, my dad had to actually separate from us. And so it was just me, my mom, my sisters, and we would have to meet him at an end point at some, 
at some moment in time. I think it was like a week or two. Um, but could you imagine? You don't know if your dad is even going to show up. Uh, mind you, he's already been in prison for a year and sure. eight months. Yeah. Now you're leaving the country. You're fleeing. You're on foot. You get to a certain place. You're in a foreign country. And your father has to separate from you completely. And you have to just hypothetically just wait for him to meet, meet you at this one spot. So my dad was telling me the story and I was just like, wow, I can only imagine how difficult this must have been for my mom. For your mom. Yeah, alone my siblings, yeah. you know what I mean? So like, can you imagine having to, like, I'm just thinking about this, like from your mom's perspective and then from your dad's perspective, just having to, like your mom is responsible suddenly for all of these kids. She's by herself in a yeah. foreign country. And then your dad, who just got out of prison, has to separate from his family again yeah. and hope that he's going to see them again. That's crazy. <sighs> yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, it's 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 huge. It's huge. It's I, I can't even wrap my brain around it. But I, I do think about it always once in a while just to like, I don't know, I, I really want to have a vivid picture of what it felt like because I want to live it with them in a way. I don't want them to feel like they only were the ones that experienced it. But it's, yeah, it's something unimaginable for sure. Has your dad, so my father was also a product of a civil war in Lebanon. Yeah. And to this day, he doesn't really talk about it. I've tried. I've tried to like, and you know, like poke and prod him. and get it out of him and like wait for like, you know, the right moment yeah. where we're laughing about something and, you know, ask him like slowly into the conversation yeah. and he'll give me little bits of information and it's taken years to get like little bits of information, but he know. still like closes down. I'm, has your dad, do you feel that your dad has opened up to you in that sense or does he still withdraw? I, there's, so I talked to him about everything except the, the part where his parents and his siblings got killed. Hmm. That's always been like a, not because I can't talk to him about it. He'll tell me stories here and there about my grandparents and so on and so forth. But I, I just can't, I, I don't know how to properly phrase questions and to right. like. And you also almost want to spare him from reliving it. I, yeah. That's another part of it. It's like he's been reliving it for his entire life. So it's like we try to avoid certain topics like that, but everything else he's super transparent because he's a politician so he's very good with his words he mm. understands how life is he's been a very positive influence on everyone around him being able to go from that and still like making it and succeeding in life with his family and raising these kids and everything like it takes a lot to be able to do all that and still remain positive yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously it affected my mom differently my mom went through uh, very many challenges through it emotionally um, but luckily we were there united together and mm -hmm. we were able to support each other um, and that's another thing it's like family matters a lot in the Middle East like you don't separate from your family at all so you're with them every stage of your life mm. um, so you are their backbone in many ways you help them grow you help them through their challenges and for men specifically when it comes to being able to open up and talk about things like I I've been talking to my sisters since I was a kid about my emotions uh, mind you I have three older sisters so it might be easier you, like is yeah. it do you think it's a byproduct of having sisters around you to encourage that I've seen scenarios where an older sister has been like my cousins have older sisters like the the, the boys are the younger of the the pair yeah and they also are comfortable having conversations because they've had sisters to influence that oh yeah so yeah without a doubt my sisters have been the pillars of my emotions for so many things in my life. Uh, whether it's just questioning th things with them about, you know, uh, our childhood or how to make big decisions in life, but they are, they're your support system. So it, I mean, it would be such a shame not to use the people around you to help yourself yeah. and not help yourself in a negative light. You're just helping yourself grow. Yeah. Um, and maybe in some, some men, it's a masculinity thing. Um, and I can totally see that. But if you're fortunate enough to have siblings or to have people around you that you that can support you, then definitely take advantage of that. What would you say to the, the guys out there, either in the Middle Eastern community or just in the, the, the broader community in general, who hear you say these things and then go, um, that's not what masculinity is? No, and rightfully, like I said, everyone has their way of dealing with things. But those emotions carry forward in your life. And then they get they get uh, 
they affect your children, they affect your partner in the future, they affect the way that you work and the way you think about yourself. Um, if you, there has to be a stage of enlightenment in everyone's life where they sit with themselves and they say, these are the things that are affecting me and these are the things I want to change about myself and this is the things I do really well. Mm. And if you can't reflect on yourself and change yourself or ask for support, or that is a sign of weakness to me. That is the opposite it's of masculinity. Not strength, yeah. Because masculinity is all about being the strength at the, the, the pillar of, of your life. And the people around you would need you in their life because you're that strong and confident. But to get to that confidence and strength, you really need to understand who you are. And you can't allow certain things to piss you off. Like, if you're telling me you're a masculine person, but you have road rage every time we're in a car, that's the opposite of masculinity to me. That's just someone who doesn't know how to control their emotions. That's not a leader. A leader knows how to control their emotions because they're going to be faced with tremendous things. And they're not going to allow their emotions to carry out their answers. Yeah. So that's that's knowledge knowledge is different not everyone has the opportunity to obtain certain lights certain levels of knowledge and then mm. through knowledge you have the self-reflection that happens um i think i got that through university for sure because you're learning all the time you start to just brainstorm things and learn about yourself um and you're you grow. exposed to different yeah. ideas different people yeah all that stuff Learning is key in life. You got to constantly be learning. <laughs> Always. And there's different stages of learning. I was talking to my friend about this. I was like, you learn to be a child. You learn to be an adult. But you don't learn to be a, like a, a parent. You don't learn to be a partner. You don't learn to be all these things. What we do is we experiment to learn these things. Mm. But there's no learning actual process for these things. No, man. Like it's, and it's not that difficult. You just have to kind of involve yourself in, in well, you that you got to want to learn it too, yeah. right? And I think the point you make about, you know, you don't learn to be parents. I love saying this because I feel like I always have to remind people, our parents were learning to be parents for the first time. Yeah, They're going through life for the first time, just like you and I have dreams and ambitions and we want to do this, this, and this. They wanted to do this, this, and this. They wanted to you know, start a hobby, start a side business, go and travel, go and experience life, live with their friends. And that was stripped away for a lot of them. And completely, we often criticize them for taking harsh tones with us or for being strict with us and all these things without realizing that they packed up, they moved across the world. They started in another country. They yeah. didn't know the language. They're just figuring it out so it's that cold. you and I can. And it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> just it's so cold. you, it's cold. Yeah. So just so you and I can yeah. figure out how to have a life. Yeah. And it's just, it's remarkable because that for me is a constant reminder when I get upset about the little things. Yeah. I go, you know what? My, what my parents had to do just to come to Canada. Nothing I'm dealing with resembles that nothing. challenge, that hardship. No nothing. Way. No way. And I don't have any reason to be as upset because they had every excuse, every yeah. reason to be upset, to call it quits and everything. And they said no. Mm -hmm. And so that part is always a, a good reminder for me. Yeah. Like our parents are everything. No, absolutely. I think it makes you like, um, in a way, fall in love with your parents more. Mm -hmm. Cause like I, I've had that many times where I'm like, damn, I love you guys. <laughs> you know, like you see you, them as you see them as gentle humans. Oh my you god! Know what I mean, yeah. like there's a there's a window of time where you see your parents as like superheroes. Yeah, they could do no wrong. They could like carry the world on their shoulders. Yeah, and as you get older, and they get older, and you see the fragility. You see them become humans more because you're an adult now. You can speak to them like an adult, and you start to realize that they were. You know, for the most part, I mean, you, you kind of hope that every parent out there does the best for their child. And we know that there's some that don't. But for the most part, they were just trying to do what's best for you. Yeah. And they didn't always know what's right yeah, and what's wrong. No, for sure. Like and they you, still don't. And they still don't. And <laughs> yeah, we, like, yeah. if I had a kid right now, I, I don't know the first thing about taking care of a kid, yeah. but I'll try and I'll learn and trial and error. And that's the whole part of it. And that's what they did. Exactly. And those lessons ultimately get passed down. So I want to ask you now. Hmm. Um, you don't have a kid. No, no children. Do you want kids? Yes. When you have kids, <laughs> yeah. What's one lesson you've learned from your parents that you want to pass down? Oh my God, one lesson. My dad, my parents are gonna go crazy if I have kids. If it's they're just the one. So happy, they're gonna be like, Whoa. <laughs> um, that's that's hard to say. I think just um, I think for for me, what I found to be 
one of the most beautiful things that I've been gifted in life is this culture. Like, it's very, very hard to not appreciate the person you are without going back and be like, why do I do the things I do? Why do I treat my friends so good? Hmm. You know, why do people come to my house and I literally open up my house to them like it's like theirs? And that's our culture. We have certain things that we do that we've learned through hundreds of, not hundreds of years, but yes, hundreds of years because of our culture. And those are beautiful things. And I really cherish those things. And I, I'm very proud that my parents instilled that in my personality. They gave me the language. They gave me the traditions. They gave me the food, the, the beauty of my culture to be able to share with my future children. Mm-hmm. I think that is important. Is there ever a scenario where you would want that part of your persona to come through? My content? <laughs> uh, it's hard. I mean, this is the thing. I, I don't try to say that I live in multiple, multiple universes, but um, in a way I do. I have... I see what I do on social media as my work. Hmm. I don't constitute that as my personality and who I am because at the end of the day, I'm going to meet with people in real life and they're going to get to know who I am. But the person I'm on social media is, is, this is my work. I have to wake up just like you and and everyone else and do something to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I've chosen that to be the way I make my living. It's difficult for it not to seem like this is the person's personality because on social media, it varies. You have people who are giving you everything, their children, their personalities, yeah. their day-to-day life. And so it's easy for you to just look at someone else and be like, oh, that person is just like, that must be them. This is who they are. Yeah. No, that's not who I am. This is, these are things I'm really interested in. I love traveling. I love cars. I love luxury things. This is just some, my interest. Like most, I, I don't think there's a single guy in the world who won't like those things. No. To be with you. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, I've just been able to curate my content to be only those things yeah. and make a business out of it. And I'm very happy at the fact that I did it. Would I like to add more of my personality into my content? I think so. I think there'll be a, a turning point because of the way that social media is changing that you have to, you won't have a choice. Hmm. They're going to be almost like living in your shoes as you experience all these things in life. Um, and I'm excited about that. I think people will learn another depth to who I am uh, and also be able to like begin gain new inspiration in yeah. some sort of manner. Is yeah. there, if someone was starting on social media today, they're thinking about starting a business, they want to get into content creation and all that stuff. Being someone who's done this now for over a decade, let's say, over a decade? Yeah. Yeah. What what advice would you give them? Or what advice would you give a young Alan? If you can go back. Yeah. What advice, everything you know today, everything that's worked, everything that's failed, what would you say? Branding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, oh my God. Your your personal brand is is everything. And it doesn't, again, have to be who you are. It It's just what you identify your work to be. Again, it depends on what your goal is. Some people want to be on social media because they're very intrigued by this whole notion of becoming famous or having a substantial following. Uh, Some people are in it because they're like, oh, I can make a really good living. And it's not the most difficult work life style. Sure, yeah. So for me, it's like this balance of both things. It's like, yeah, I can... I can show people my personality, my interests, my hobbies, but I can make a living off of this. So how can I do this but be still proud of the content I create and want to do this every single day of my life still? And that all goes back to your branding. That's identifying your interests, saying these are the things I really like and I'm not going to do anything else because these are my core interests. Because your interests are the things that will help allow you to get up every single day and want to do what you're doing. Mm. If I didn't like traveling, I wouldn't be able to do this. I love traveling, which is why I like taking photos because mm. then I go and reflect on that experience. I can share with my followers and so on and so forth. I love art. So I've created images that are unique to my style. Mm. It's like a painter. You're not going to see Van Gogh do 18,000 different types of paintings. You're going to see him do one style of painting for the most part. And that's what he's recognized for. Mm. And just as a content creator, it's very important to build your brand around an identity of style. Um, and then you identify what kind of clients you want to work with. You know, what brands do you stand for? I love brands that, you know, bring accountability on the market. They're, they're positive influence on our society. Mm. Um, even if they're luxury, let them have a history that is meaningful and significant. 
Um, and so these are the things I look for when I'm partnering with brands and I don't partner with every brand. I, I'm very specific with them because it all goes back to my interests and my branding. Right. So branding is key. I think branding is the best way to be successful. And I've seen a lot of the, the talent you've had on, on your, on your podcast. All of them are very unique to who they are because they have a solid brand. Yep. They built an identity around their interests. They built their online presence around their, their key interests, of course. But they're also showing the world that this is the area that we, we kind of focus in and we're not going out and venturing into substantially different things. Hmm. I mean, they'll, it's always important to dabble and experiment, but that's part of the evolution. But if you're starting off, find your interests, find your key focus and build that brand around it. Is there, I guess it doesn't really matter which platform you start on ultimately like just the more the better i think if you're a funny person maybe tiktok is the best option yeah tiktok there's certain platforms like those pov yeah. or like those face to face if you like talking and if you're someone who has a lot of information to share you know youtube is a great platform for long form content if you're someone who's an educator or someone who wants to show something that is a long process hmm. i love youtube i i was on youtube for many years and i still am but like not as much anymore it's hard to grow on youtube in the beginning, when I was on the platform, it wasn't hard, but I think it was like the time when like photographers were seen as like the new mm. <laughs> Tom Cruise of the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, that has changed drastically, but it, I think there is still a lot of space to grow on YouTube. You just have to find your niche and your audience, mm. um, and you you have to be creative on YouTube because now attention span of people is much shorter. Even shorter because all the other platforms are pushing for shorter content. Um, but it depends on your personality. You sit down again, it's your interest, right? Like if you're like, I like to talk, then go on a platform that you can talk and elaborate on your ideas. Mm -hmm. If you're like, I just want to be the, I don't want to be the face of my work, then maybe Instagram's better because it's a photo sharing app. You know, you can do videos that don't even have to have you in them. Mm. And, but growing is difficult. Growth is very, very difficult nowadays. There's so many people in the world who are so talented as we have we seen. Uh, every single day I'm coming across an account and being like, wow. This yeah. person is incredibly talented. Um, and that's super cool to see. It just means there's more competition, so you have to get better at what you do. How do you uh, how do you take stock? How do you... Actually, let me rephrase. You've achieved a measure of success in your career to this point. You work with some of the biggest brands in the world. How do you ensure that you stay on top of your game and you don't sort of sit back and let others pass you by? So this is the one... Thing that I saw, so I was doing online workshops and I was always teaching. I only do one on one online workshops, I don't do the whole like pre recorded buy my workshops. And the reason why is because I don't think that someone will ever learn as much as they want unless they talk to you yeah. and learn from your experience. So, one of the things I always tell my students is at some point, you're going to sit down, you're going to see everyone doing the same thing you're doing, and you're going to have to do something different. And that's when the, you have to pivot and substantially change your focus. So I was doing automotive photography for a long time. And then I got into automotive video content. And then I started doing storytelling in, in the automotive space. And it was very different because my approach was unique in a sense that like brands were not asking me just to create the content, but for me to direct and be in the content also. That's a whole nother mix of, of requirements. Yeah. But I sat back and I said, what space can I be that I still love I still love cars. I love this. I love the innovation of the automotive industry. Like, where can I go that is unique that no one else is in right now? And it turned out to be Formula One at the time. I went into Formula One when there was still like no one really knew what Formula One was. There was no Netflix series. There was yeah, nothing. Was it was a European yeah. sport. Like mm -hmm. it was still like this really expensive European sport that I'd say is there was they had a massive fan base, but not it wasn't your. It wasn't a name. Wasn't that, as, you couldn't yeah. just drop it in someone's house and they'd be like, "Oh yeah, like I know this Seems driver." Like now, yeah, now every 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 person I encounter knows about Formula One. Exactly. Has been to a race, watches a race. So once in a while, I'll sit back and I'll reflect on what's happening in the world, and I'll say, "I want to focus on that." No one's there. Let me go and be the first person in that industry. Hmm. Let me capture this space and try to get above everyone else in that space. And at least if I'm there, I can inspire a lot of more people to enter it as well. Sure. And I have. I've inspired substantial amounts of content creators to be in Formula One. And that's been super fun. It's 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 a really nice thing to see. But now it's like I need to find the next thing to be able to kind of move away from it. Yeah. And it's not to say that there's no space for me in all these things, but it's nice to just be able to like find interesting things that you can focus on once in a while that aren't your everyday tasks. 
did uh, did you reach out to F1 or did they reach out to you? Like, was it just you went and created the content and then they saw it? Or like, I guess what I'm trying to get to is at some point, you know, the brands are not just going to approach you. You almost have to create content that they might like and then show them up front, hey, this is what I can create. Totally. Well, in the very beginning, it was just me finding interest in Formula One. Um, and then I got invited to Formula One through a sponsor. Okay. But I had already been working with Mercedes for a long time. So Mercedes put me in touch with the AMG F1 team. Mm -hmm. And then that was the first dialogue or conversation I had about working with a team. And then I met people in Formula One that were at a certain level um, in certain departments that wanted me to be a bigger part of Formula One rather than just a team. Mm. And so it's changed. I've worked with teams sometimes. I work with sponsors sometimes. Sometimes I just go because I love the sport. Yeah. Uh, it all varies. But you kind of find your way in once you're there and you see where your interests lie. Mm. I think also it's like, what teams do you support? What brands? Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a all very like, yeah. yeah. It's very competitive. You know, I can't, like, I can't be shooting uh Mercedes for like six years and then be working with McLaren F1 team. Right. When there's a Mercedes <laughs> team in Formula One. That's what I found to be tricky actually. When I got into Formula One, I was like, how do I decide who to work with? Because I I work with form like I work with Mercedes already. So it's like I can't just be jumping teams. I want to kind of have this clear path. Mm. And again, it goes to branding, right? So how do you decide? Well, you navigate, right? You say, you know what, maybe I'm not gonna work with this team because I can't. It's just, it goes opposite against my personal brand. And people are going to be like, well, he's just working with any team that comes across. And that's where you have to like pivot and just be like, you know what, I'll take a loss here. Well, that's the, the I think that's yeah. the key point there. It's hard to walk away from someone offering you money to, to do something. All the time. Yeah. yeah. I had a toothpick company offer me so much money. A for toothpick. toothpick. Yeah, okay. a toothpick. And it's a great brand. Honestly, smart branding, smart everything. I really enjoyed the th discussion I had with the, the company, but it was a toothpick company that was willing to offer me thousands of dollars to help promote the brand. And I was like, I can't, like, this is just not, this doesn't sit, yeah. you know, as much as I'd like to, but it just doesn't make sense. So you would, so your advice to other creators ultimately would be if, you know, you, there ha you have to be sol solid in your brand and you also have to be, willing to walk away from something if it doesn't match that brand because ultimately yeah. the reason they even came to you is because of the brand that you built yeah if you look at some of the most successful people in the world they've been held they've been dealt maybe like two or three options that really helped them skyrocket in their mm -hmm. career but to get to those places they worked very very strategically in one space and that is key like mm -hmm. i've focused on the automotive industry for the last 10 years now so like I, eventually whatever I want to do in that space is going to be easily accessible to me because I have the network, I have the reach, I have the the background for it. Um, and a lot of creators, we get lost in this vastness that social media is. And it's very easy to be convinced because of the money that comes in and the substantial amounts of money. Hmm. Um, if you're very, very famous on social media, you're getting handed millions of dollars. It's not. It's not like... I think this is the one thing that always surprises me about people's reaction when I tell them how much influencers or content creators make. It's substantial. It's life-changing money. So you have to know how to navigate through life with that new money that you have, but yeah. also you have to keep consistent with the content you're creating and not sell out and work with every brand. Because at one point or another, brands start to talk and they start to say, you know what, this person is really good, but... They've been working with X, Y, and Z every single other month, and we can't we can't have this person on our right on our yeah. roster. That's very interesting. I didn't I didn't think about it from that lens too. Is that you're constantly? It's not just you accepting and and rejecting. It's the other brands deciding whether you're a fit at that point anymore. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that happens quite a lot. Or brands will message me and be like, "Do you have any recommendations?" of other creators mm -hmm. and then you send them recommendations and they tell you exactly why they're not want to work with this person, this person, this person, this person. And it's always to do with the fact that this person has worked with all their competitors or mm -hmm. so on and so forth. I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Like if you, yeah. if you have like 10 million followers and you're promoting, I don't know, a, a certain type of coffee and the next day you're doing Nespresso, it, it, people are going to be like, well, uh, people won't even know what to believe anymore. Yeah. They're, they're just being like, this person's selling us anything. Yeah. And it's, 
uh, for me, what was really important in the process of building my brand was that I'm not an advocate for a specific brand. I'm there to show you that this is a brand I really like because of X, Y, and Z reasons. And that doesn't mean I can't like other brands for X, Y, and Z reasons. But I'm going to try to make a selective group of brands I'm going to work with. Hmm. In the automotive space, I haven't worked with any other... I've only worked with luxury brands because the moment I don't work with a luxury brand, it's going to be, it's going to go a little bit opposite of what I've been preaching and the lifestyle For that I'm living. Yeah. And not to say that that's a bad thing. Of course, I'm showing that there's, there's practical, affordable options in the automotive space and there's luxury options, but it just doesn't tie well with my brand. Mm. My brand is always about this ultra luxury kind of experience. And if I'm going to continue doing that path, it makes more sense for me. Amazing. Alan, this there's is, a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's definitely a lot. And it sounds like there might have to be a part two to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, um, time flies. Yeah, it does. It's almost been an hour. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> really this is what was. happens when you're talking to your friend, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having Thank you for me. sharing that story with me. I appreciate And with it. everyone who, who listens and watches, I think it's, it's always really, uh, really nice to get a sense of who a person really is and what their motivations are and how they became who they are today. And like, as you were talking and the things that you were saying, you know, one of the things that really stood out to me was every interaction I've ever had with you before this moment here today was positive. Mm -hmm. You were always positive. And as you explain your story of how, you know, you always try to make sure that you leave a good impression. Like you want to be that host. Yeah. I was like, it all makes sense. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for, always greeting me with such positive like uh, and i love it i love the stuff that you do man uh you're an incredible creator but uh, i love the stuff that you stand for more importantly and i think we need more of that and i think we need more of that maybe in this space as well i think a lot of times creators once they get that big following or they start seeing the dollars you know their heads sometimes inflate a little too much yeah um it's always nice to come across one that's still humble about it. So thank you for your time and thank you for sharing the story, my friend. Thank you for having me, man. I, I appreciate it. No, I appreciate you. <laughs> we can do this part like, like another. Yeah, <laughs> it's like when they leave, you know, yeah. at least from people when yeah. they leave, they never 20 leave. 20-minute goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> you want tea? <laughs> <laughs> come back, I have desserts. <laughs> no, but amazing. Thank you. We're going to do part two for sure. Amazing. I'm down. Always. Amazing. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, guys.